Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everybody's doing well. I hope your uh, semester is going well so far. I know it's a little, little crazy in these first few weeks with everything, so <laughs> good luck. Okay, so we're gonna talk about best practices for uh, producing uh, video lectures. So like uh, Michelle mentioned, my name is Rob Grookett. Um, I'm at the Office of Distributed Learning and we support online courses and programs at USC. I know it's kind of an outdated uh, title, but that's probably going to change in the next uh, few months, maybe. All right, so one of the main services that our office provides is we have two course production studios. So if you are teaching, if you're a USC Columbia instructor, um, this is a service that's available to you for free. Um, so as you can see, if you're doing lect lecture capture, any kind of video audio recordings, uh, we have a light board, we have all kinds of backdrops, green screen, overhead camera, teleprompter. We mainly use Camtasia, but you can also record with Panopto in our studio and obviously Microsoft Office in the Adobe Creative Cloud. So all of those great things, all the bells and whistles you would need. And I mentioned the light board. So some of you might be curious what that is. So this is what the light board looks like. It looks small there, but it's actually about, let's say six or seven feet wide. And this will kind of give you an idea of what it looks like. In general the lab, when we're representing this three-step cycle, it's shown in this way. And so what you have is your higher denaturing temperatures, and it decreases down to a temperature that's dependent on your primer. So I put an X here because this is going to fluctuate. So you can see from that, the whole idea is that you can teach without turning your back to the students and kind of look them in the eye and, and, and have more engagement with this tool. So it's a really cool feature. If you're interested in using, you can contact us and we'll get you some time. All right, so let's talk about some best practices. When you're first thinking about recording any kind of video content for your course, you obviously want to think about time. So when are you going to record? Are you going to start recording before the semester, during the semester, the summer before? There are a lot of different ways to do this, but obviously the sooner the better. If there's any kind of editing involved, that may take some time. So you, you want to leave uh, a little bit of wiggle room in between um, your recording and when you actually post those videos. So that's very important. So you really want to think about that um, and really try to get that done as soon as possible. And where are you going to record? So you can record at home, in your office, or use a service on campus. Um, who's going to do the editing? Are you going to edit it yourself? You definitely want to figure that out. Obviously, a lot of people are recording from home and from their office, and that's totally fine. We'll kind of go through some best practices that you can use at home or in your office that will help you um, put out a nicer, better quality product. All right, and the how. So that's obviously one of the biggest things too. What software are you going to use? Are you going to do a voiceover PowerPoint? Are you going to use something like Prezi? Are you going to record an introduction video? Where's that video going to be hosted? Is it going to be in Blackboard? Are you going to use something like Panopto or other things like YouTube and Vimeo? There are a lot of different options out there. So we'll kind of go over those and you can see which ones work best for you. All right, so preparing. So when you're preparing to record, this is just like teaching face-to-face. -face. It's the same content pedagogy and assessment. You want to prepare your script and materials ahead of time, just like you normally would. And you also want to begin with accessibility in mind. This is extremely important because you need to do this up front for the most part. We'll talk a little bit about why, but you want to do this up front so you don't have to do as much work later on. If, for instance, you have a student with a disability in your course, you might have to kind of scramble to get either a transcript or closed captioning for that course. So you really want to do that ahead of time. So why do you need to begin with accessibility? Why do you even need to think about accessibility with videos? Well, 76% of college students with a learning disability say they didn't even tell their college that they have one. So they can't ask for accommodations without disclosing that disability. So that's important to know. And of course, regardless of whether they have a disability, a majority of students use closed captions at least some of the time, and they find them helpful, roughly 90%. I know I use them all the time too, and you obviously wanna make sure they are not just there, they need to be accurate. So things like YouTube, it does have auto captioning, but that's not 100% accurate. 
So you really want to make sure they are accurate. We'll kind of go through that. So some other things to think about the font size for your slides, they recommend a 24 point minimum sans that's, that's the font that works best for accessibility, sufficient contrast for text and background on slides. So you don't want two colors that are really close together. Black and white obviously has the most contrast and you can visit the digital accessibility page for more detailed information. And that's one thing that they're really working on is kind of bolstering the whole accessibility support system at USC. So they do a lot of good things. If you go to that page, there's a lot of tutorials for all things accessibility. So you can use some of that information for your face-to-face -face course as well, for your syllabi, for any kind of content you're putting on, PDFs, all the, that stuff, all the good stuff. Okay, so once you're ready to record, you want to prepare, you want to get your a little recording studio ready to record. Choose the appropriate settings to try to avoid any background distractions or sounds. Just pick a quiet area um, where you can really avoid all of those things. Um, you probably want to consider using a virtual background. Um, there are a lot of them available out there. Uh, USC has made a few with some pre-made USC backgrounds. You can find that on the uh, USC communications toolbox the sc.edu slash toolbox, and they're branded with the USC logo and different images around campus. That's one really good thing to use in case you're recording in your house and the kitchen's in the background, there are kids, there are animals, all kinds of distractions. So this is a really good way to kind of avoid that and kind of give you a more consistent look and feel throughout your course. So you can have it branded for your college or your course or just for USC. So it's really important to think. All right, if you use a whiteboard or blackboard in your face-to-face -face lectures, you might want to consider using a document camera or another annotation device. There are a lot of apps out there, easy teach, scribble together. There are a lot of them out there that do all the same things. So it'll record your screen. You can annotate on the screen. Some of them even record your face too. So you can do a full, full recording with you, your voice and the content as one. You want to determine whether you want to use these uh, lectures for later use and other courses that can affect uh, what you capture. So really think about that ahead of time and be aware of shelf life. Try not to include current dates and events or even something as simple as putting the date on the opening slide. That's one thing I've seen over and over and over again. People just don't think about it when they record. They start their slate off you know, fall 2023 or the actual date. And then we end up having to go back and, and uh, edit those. So I would avoid any kind of current dates and events unless that's part of your, your content. All right, you want to connect with your students. So one way to do that, just really simple, is just setting your camera at eye level. You don't want them to be looking at your chin or from uh, the top of your head, all of those things, or from the side. So you want to be looking right into the camera and trying to connect as much as possible because in an online course, or even if it's not an online course, even if um, it's just a video for your blended course, any kind of extra engagement is good. You also want to make sure your face is well lit. Obviously there are a few ways to do that, but you just want to make sure the room is lit enough to where your whole face is shown. It doesn't have to be too fancy. It doesn't have to look like a professional studio. It's, it's fine. They just need to be able to see your face clearly. Try to avoid backlight and overhead lighting. So don't try not to sit next to a window or somewhere where there's a bright light coming from uh, outside. All right, obviously you want to test your equipment. So I would recommend just doing a one to two minute video as a test and watch it back and see how it looks and sounds and, and make any adjustments after that. That's really important. What you don't want to do is start recording and record for 30 minutes and think everything's fine. And then you go to watch the video and the sound is cutting in and out or um, something doesn't look right. You really want to test your equipment and make sure everything is working perfectly when you get started. And if you have any questions as I'm speaking, please feel free to raise your hand and I'll answer those. And also at the end of this session. All right, just a tip. If you notice that your video or audio is less than ideal, it's not very good quality, um, you might want to consider just upgrading that. Um, if you are doing it from home, there are a lot of microphones out there that kind of give you um, much better quality for a decent price. In the past, this was not really possible. You really had to spend a lot of money, but now you can really get away with not spending very much and having a pretty decent quality um, recordings. You might want to use a smartphone too. 
that sounds crazy, but these days the, the quality of, of even these smartphones is good enough to really have a quality video. So that's just fine. Just one simple tip. Um, don't let your outfit overpower your, your lecture. Try to wear solid colors. Um, this is the Moray effect. So if you have a shirt that has a lot of lines in it, you kind of get this weird effect, but it's also something that can affect your audio and even your video. It can cause some other issues. So try to avoid that and just wear solid colors. All right, try not to wear glasses. If you have to wear glasses, that's fine. You can just turn down your monitor brightness and move the lighting away from the camera. But that's just one more thing. If the students can't see your eyes, that's not good. It's not ideal, but it's not a huge issue. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about engagement with these videos. So, and most of this is backed up by studies that have shown that uh, engagement can be helped by a lot of different things. So one of them is to just be professional, but also relatable and personable. So you don't want it to be overly professional where it sounds more corporate, like you're doing a corporate video, still be relatable and personable, like you're speaking to your students. So definitely do that. The personalization principle, use a conversational style rather than formal language during multimedia instruction has been shown to have a large effect on students learning. Keep it short. This one's very, very, very important. If you want to divide the content into manageable, manageable chunks, you've probably heard this before. I know a few years ago, there was a lot of pushback on this because a lot of online courses were just taking their face-to-face -face lecture, their hour long lecture, hour and a half, two hour long lecture, and just making a video and then posting the video of that lecture. So we don't recommend you doing that. If you've already done that, you might want to consider taking that longer video and chunking it or chopping it into smaller sections and making it, let's say like lecture one, part one, part two, part three, lecture two, part one, part two, and so on. It's, it's really important because engagement really, really drops off for students after about five to six minutes. Uh, obviously five to six minutes might be a little too short, but just keep in mind that engagement drops off. So for instance, at our office, we post a lot of online videos here and we're able to look at the, the engagement in our analytics and we see the same thing. I think for our videos around 10 minutes is usually when it drops off and it's a steep decline after that. So really think about that. That's really important. And that affects cognitive load, technology, the access to high-speed internet, all of those things, and flexible consumption. So allowing students to really watch these videos on their own time and, and not have to watch a very, very long video. So just keep that in mind. All right, you also want to speak relatively quickly and with enthusiasm. More studies have shown that that helps, helps with engagement. As the uh, speaking rate is increased, engagement is also increased. That doesn't mean you have to speak really, really fast, like I'm probably doing, but just keep that in mind. You don't need to speak too slow to make sure they hear you. And I kind of talked about this before. So informal talking head videos are more engaging for students than the big budget studio uh, production videos. So it doesn't have to be over the top with the production value, but it is good to have an informal talking head along with your video and not just audio and the content. So voiceover PowerPoints are okay as long as they see your face at the beginning and the end, or, or maybe a few times in between that. All right, you want to signal important information to viewers, and you also want to eliminate extraneous information. Uh, this is called weeding. So this is kind of the same theme. It doesn't need to be a big production. You don't need to have music and uh, complex backgrounds and crazy animations all over the screen or, and, all, and all things like that. So keep it simple, focus on the content and having engagement with your students. Also, same thing, do I have to record my face? Videos that intersperse and introductory instructors talking head with slides are more engaging than slides alone. Which I don't think that's a shock to anyone, but it is important to do that. Like I mentioned, you can begin with an introductory video that could be just for the course, which is good to have. It could also be for a module, at the beginning of the module, you wanna introduce yourself and the course, the subject, and really, for instance, you could say, okay, this is lecture one. Today, we're going to talk about this, 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 and this. And at the end of the lecture, you can say in the next video, we're going to talk about A, B, and C. So many overview videos you can have in each module to kind of go over what, what you've talked about in the previous few lessons to kind of catch people up on what they've missed. 
that's really good to have in your course too. And those videos, you want to keep them even shorter. So no longer than five minutes, I would say. All right. And I, I kind of mentioned this, so transitions between videos, um, this helps with a cohesive learning experience. Like I said, you want to start by introducing the lecture and what they're going to learn in that lecture. And then at the end of the video, you want to say, um, in the next video, we're going to talk about A, B, and C. So it's the same concept. And you can use uh, some visual cues or graphics like title screens, which are great to have. But like I mentioned before, you don't want to have uh, any dates on that or current events. All right, this is something else to consider embedded questions. So short little quizzes. That's something that can be very helpful for engagement as well, as you can see with the study. But there are a couple of options out there, Camtasia and Panopto. Uh, both of those, you can do this pretty easily. Panopto is probably the easiest way to do it. Any video that you upload in, into Panopto, you can overlay any quiz that might ask a question. And then if the student gets it right, then they can con uh, continue on with that video. Um, you can do things like that. So that's a really good way to add some engagement to your videos. All right. I mentioned Panopto. If you have not heard about Panopto, this is our main video hosting video recording software at USC that, that we support. You can kind of see what this looks like. You can have it separated to where the video of yourself is in the top left-hand corner with the content on the right. There are a lot of cool things you can do with this. It has auto captioning, first of all, that you can edit those captions to make those 100% accurate. You can have bookmarks and notes. And like I mentioned before, you can add quizzes and things like that. So it's a really, really cool feature. So it's a full video content management system. You can upload videos that you've already recorded and you can record directly into it. And it also integrates directly with Blackboard. So you can actually get to Panopto directly in Blackboard under the tools. Like I mentioned before, it does interactive quizzes. Um, you can add your PowerPoint slides. Uh, something I did not mention is the editing. So you can also edit your videos directly in Panopto, which is great. So even if it's a simple, you, know, you you press record in the first 10 seconds, you're not saying anything. You can easily go into Panopto and cut out that first part to, to um, just make it look a little better. All right, and something else that, that I think is really cool that might be helpful for instruct, instructors, um, you have access to analytics. So you can really look at student by student, who's watching this videos, how much of the video they're watching, and really use that to determine how you make videos in the future too. Or if you see that a student is not watching any of the videos, you can use that information for whatever you would like to do. If you want to contact the student to say, Hey, I've noticed you're not watching these videos, things like that. So it's just good to know. You can look at this and really see it, you know, what students are watching and how much they're watching. All right. So this is also important. So we have at USC, there are two different Panopto accounts. One of the accounts is from the School of Law. The other one is for all of USC. So you want to choose the main USC account. So you go to panopto.com, you add your USC network username, email, and password. And then it's going to have you choose either Panopto Main or School of Law. Obviously, you choose Main. And Michelle added a link in the chat. With more information on Panopto at USC, there's a getting started page with a lot of other tutorials and stuff in there too, to really get you started. And it's a really cool feature at USC that is also supported. So if you have any questions or any issues, you can contact the DOIT service desk and they can help you with that versus something like YouTube or Vimeo or something like that. There is no support for that at USC. All right. Some other recording options. If you're not using Panopto, Blackboard Collaborate, which we're using right now. That's an option, Microsoft Teams. You can do a PowerPoint vo uh, voiceover video and export that as a video file. Uh, Screencast-O-Matic, Prezi, there are a lot of options out there. They all work just fine. And even if you record these, these videos in something else, um, you can still upload that into Panopto and, and Blackboard. And that way you can easily share those videos with your students. Good to know. ScreenPal, interesting. Also, there are some, some other uh, software options out there, Camtasia, Nomia, um, Adobe Captivate, Articulate. Obviously, some of these have a cost to them, but they do a lot of really cool things. We use Camtasia here at our office, 
and it's great. You can do just about anything with it. It has all the bells and whistles. All right, so once you've recorded and it's time to deliver your video, there's some more things to think about. Obviously, editing is one of them. I've talked a little bit about that already. Some basic edits are great. Just clipping some time off the beginning or the end, or if there's a section in the middle that you don't like, you want to cut it out, then you can do that too pretty easily with most editing software. But too many edits can become distracting, especially if you're not experienced with editing. And just to let you know too, if you are at USC Columbia and you need some help with the editing, that's something that our office can help with. So keep that in mind. There are some free options for, for editing. DaVinci Resolve is one of them. Video editor on PC. You can just search that on your PC. I think that is still available. And of course, iMovie on Mac. Yeah, Panopta does a pretty good job with captioning, which is great. And you can go in and edit those captions too. So if it gets a couple of words wrong, you can go in and, and fix those, those two words. And of course, there's uh, Adobe Premiere Pro for editing and Final Cut. There is obviously, there's a cost involved with, with those. And like I mentioned too, you can edit directly in Panopto. I would say the editing is not super easy with Panopto. If you're trying to do a lot, it's really great for the simple edits, but you can do a lot of different things. So let's say you want to add some, some extra slides or take another video and insert video into the video you've already uploaded into Panopto. So you can actually do that. So you can say, okay, at a minute into this video, I want to insert this other video and you can do that pretty easily. All right. So you also want to embed your video. So if you're using Panopto, that's really easy to do in Panopto. You can have an embed code directly in your course, in your modules. That way students don't have to click on a direct link to open up another page. It, it just starts playing within that, that window. It just makes it a little, a little easy, easier for students. They do not recommend uploading videos directly into Blackboard. So Blackboard is not meant to be a hosting site for videos. Now, I've talked to e our e-learning e services group about this and they've said the same thing. Like that's still the case. They don't recommend you doing that. You can have issues with buffering or downloading, things like that. So keep that in mind. Panopto is great and it's connected directly with Blackboard. I don't even know why, why that's an option with Blackboard, but, but it is if they don't recommend it, but it is what it is. All right. So I've mentioned captioning a few times. YouTube and Panopto have captioning and you really want to make sure, especially if you have a course that you're going to use over and over again, make sure your captions are accurate. We don't recommend just going with the automatic captions. Please go in and edit those. If you can, one word can change the whole meaning of what you're saying. And we've actually seen that happen a few times where the auto captioning was wrong. So the best practice is not to use automatic captions. Um, you want to edit those. Like I mentioned, captions can be edited in YouTube and Panopto. Um, in YouTube, it's a little more difficult. It might take a little bit of time to, to figure out how to use um, that system. We've been using that for years and it, it does work really well. And YouTube does a, a really, really good job of, of auto captioning. Um, and also I mentioned too, if you're teaching a blended or online course at USC Columbia, we can assist you with, with editing those captions. All right, once again, hosting the video, we recommend Panopto. You can also use YouTube or Vimeo. You don't have to use Panopto if, if, if you don't want to. You can use Teams, Nomia, Screencast, which I don't know if that name has changed. <laughs> the names change all the time. As you can see with Nomia, it's uh, formerly Relay. And a note to Ensemble is now gone. USC Sunset Ensemble, I think it was a year or two ago. So Ensemble is not an option. Collaborate is still an option, but we don't know how long that's going to be. So I, I would recommend not using Collaborate to store any, any videos. You might have to, in the next couple of years, transfer those videos over to Panopto or something like that. So keep that in mind. We could be getting something like Zoom soon too. That might also be an option in the future, but currently I would stay away from collaborate as far as recordings go. You can still use that for uh, live sessions like we're doing now, but possibly not in the future for recording. 
All right, so we have a faculty toolbox on our page. It's sc.edu slash DL. You can go there. There's all kinds of information there if you're teaching an online course, so it's not just video content. Thank you for that. I think we had a question. How about a foreign language in closed caption? If you are captioning it with a foreign language, um, that's something that can be done too, unless you are taking a foreign language and, and changing that to another language. That would be a little different than you would have to uh, do that first. Like I mentioned, you can go to sc.edu slash DL. There's a lot of great information there. All right, and we'll just open this up for more questions if you have any. I know I kind of ran through that quickly, so if you have any questions, and, and I think Michelle will send these slides afterwards as well, mm -hmm. too. Sure. Okay, like I mentioned before, our office, we do a lot of other things, too, not just audio and video, and video recordings. We do help with proctoring for online courses. We also, have, like I mentioned, too, helping with transcription and closed captioning. Camtasia is not free. They might have a, a free trial, possibly, but it is not a free service. We do have that available here. If you wanted to come here and use Camtasia, we do have that here. And I will say with Panopto, Panopto does some similar things that Camtasia does, where it does record the screen and your face at the same time and kind of separates the two. So you can determine how you want that to look to students. So in Camtasia, in, in Camtasia for instance, you don't have to have your face on the screen at the whole time. So you can actually go in and edit and have, you know, your face pop up at the beginning and then it goes away and then pops up, you know, multiple times throughout the lesson. So there are a lot of different ways to do that. You have a lot of flexibility when you record that way. All right. Well, if you don't have any more questions, I'm going to drop my email in here. If you want to contact me directly with any questions or if you want to schedule any time in our studios, we can do that as well. All right. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Have a good rest of your day. Yeah.